Between 1770 and 1830, over 35,000 people were sentenced to death. But only one in 10 were actually executed. But the elite in society were indifferent to any notions of unequal justice. They believed capital punishment worked as a deterrent. And even enlightened thinkers of the time, such as the churchman and philosopher William Paley, were able to justify this even if innocent people were executed. And when he was told that many people were hanged who didn't deserve it or who might even be innocent, oh, he said, in a very fine language, of course, uh, so what? These people may be deemed to have hanged for England. In other words, their deaths were part of the price we had to pay for social order and deference to the established hierarchy. This view was supported by the work of German philosopher Immanuel Kant, who argued that even in a civilized society, the state had the right to punish the individual. For Kant, the only purely evil thing is an evil will. So you measure the seriousness of the crime by the attitude of the criminal. For Kant, the death penalty was a moral imperative. It was a duty, but it was to be done without any emotion. We did it as a matter of duty. And in fact, we celebrate human dignity by executing them, by saying, you are a responsible agent. You chose to do what you do, what you did, and you deserve to die for it. We will not look at you as a means to deter others from committing crimes. He firmly believed that you never use a person as a means to your ends. Human beings are ends in themselves. Kant's ideas continued to influence the debate about punishment into the 19th century and a new Victorian era. But by the 1830s, the election of the Whigs into government brought a new reforming agenda. The Reform Act famously gives the vote to the middle classes, but also a lot of the statutes on the bloody code are repealed. So that by the end of the 1830s, uh, you can hang really only for murder. Despite this new age of reform, the Victorians were still committed to retaining the death penalty for those convicted of murder. But for other lesser crimes, they wanted a more proportional punishment that fitted the crime. So a sheep stealer would no longer be treated the same as a murderer. Punishment ought to be not only proportional, but by being proportional to the offence, rational. Measurement proportionality is one big idea that begins to unseat the old system uh, that had, of course, gone back for centuries. Dismantling the bloody code had an immediate effect on the Victorian justice system. Now juries were more likely to convict in the knowledge that the death penalty no longer applied. They eliminated capital punishment from rape in 1842. And what happened afterwards is that the conviction rate went straight through the roof. It went from a modern um, equivalent of about 5% convictions to between 13 and 18% conviction rates, simply because they changed the nature of the punishment associated with that particular crime. But as conviction rates soared, so too did the Victorians fear of crime. This fear came from the presence of a new mass urban population, which during the Industrial Revolution had migrated to Britain's cities in their thousands. As you start to have very large numbers of fairly poor people crowded into districts together, society is becoming much more concerned about criminality, about the possibility of a criminal underclass, about the, the consequences of having so many poor people congregated in very small areas. 
One of the other things that's happening in the early 19th century is for the first time the government is starting to collect figures as to how many people are brought before the courts. And again, the figures always seem to be going up. Of course, we know now that the population is rising anyway. The figures seem to be going up, so of course that helps to kind of contribute to this fear of crime, which is really starting to emerge in the early 19th century. In 1862, there is a moral panic about mugging that is precipitated in the newspapers by one solitary event when an MP called Pilkington was mugged by a garotta. With conviction rates rising, but fewer crimes subject to the death penalty, the Victorians searched for new ideas about punishment. Up until now, local jails had just held prisoners before they were punished. But into the 1840s, as part of a wider expansion of the state and the ending of transportation as a sentencing option, the Victorians began to build large prisons across Britain as places of both punishment and reform. A new idea of prison where you have the ordered prisons with the sexes separated, different kinds of criminals are classified, being made to perform useful work as part of their punishment, all in a specially designed building separate, set apart from the rest of the community. But those convicted of murder still faced a public execution, which by the mid-Victorian era was coming under attack from an educated elite. You got prominent publicists as well, so Dickens and Thackeray being probably the most prominent, who both attended public executions and both wrote about them. Both of them were appalled by the behaviour of the people. It was so loathsome, pitiful and vile a sight, I did not see one token in all the immense crowd, at the windows, in the streets, on the housetops, anywhere of any one emotion suitable to the occasion. No sorrow, no terror, no abhorrence, no seriousness, nothing but ribaldry, debauchery, levity, drunkenness and flaunting vice. The public execution is almost a way of saying that aggression and violence is acceptable and tolerable and it's kind of promoted by the state. And this is the very last thing that the Victorians want. They've got a kind of a civilising idea. It was this disgust at the scene of a public execution that led to the first real movement to abolish the death penalty. By the 1840s, there's a really very serious uh, movement for total abolition of capital punishment in England that pulls in people like Thackeray. The argument being that we have other ways of controlling order so that we do not need to resort to the sledgehammer uh, control delivered by the noose. But the vast majority of the population were convinced that the death penalty should be retained. And this view was openly supported by the Church of England. Now, capital punishment is a peculiar punishment because it was justified specifically on biblical terms. All the arguments were to do with the Bible. Um, after all, fines or community service, or even being put in the stocks, don't actually appear in the Bible. You know, they have killed the image of God, another human being, and so they will be killed themselves. And that was accepted by practically everyone. Convinced that the death penalty was sanctioned by God, the Victorians turned to their newly built prisons to solve the debate over public executions. It was one of the suggestions of Bishop Wilberforce that we've got these wonderful prisons. Why don't we put capital punishment into a prison? In 1868, the last public execution was carried out on British soil. Michael Barrett, an Irish Republican, was hanged outside Newgate Prison while the crowd sang a popular music hall tune, Champagne Charlie. 